And we're now live on Facebook. Okey, uh, salam sejahtera dan selamat petang kepada semua rakan sekerja di Pusat Pengajian Sains Kemasyarakatan, warga USN dan para hadirin. Uh. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Po Hyung Hong, lecturer from the School of Social Sciences of University Science Malaysia in uh, Penang. Uh. Welcome to this international webinar jointly organized by, by our school, School of Social Sciences of University Science Malaysia and uh, Southeast Asian Research Center and hub of the Lhasa L University in the Philippines. Huh? Um, even though this pandemic has greatly disrupted people's movement from one place to another, but uh, it has also uh, at the same time sparked a lot of uh, online internationalism and even online regionalism. Huh? So we hope that this webinar uh, will contribute to more inter-Southeast Asia conversation among scholars in the region. It is uh, a ground up scholarly ASEANism. So the theme of today's uh, webinar is state and community responses to COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. All together today, we have four panelists, including Dr. Sudiman Nasio from Universitas Hassanuddin in Indonesia, Mr. Kim Kong Heng from uh, the University of Queensland. Uh, he's actually a Cambodian uh, scholar, and Dr. Cleo B. Mosula from uh, Bielefeld University. Sorry if my pronunciation is incorrect and sounds funny, yeah? because that's not my native language to speak in a, a, a Spanish or, or, or German. Okay, and also Dr. Ron Bridget Villot uh, from the La Salle University. Yeah? So before this webinar start, I would like to first invite Professor Aglinda Asman, the Dean of USM's School of Social Sciences to give a few words. Uh, Professor Aglinda, please, can you please uh, turn on your uh, video and audio to speak a few words? Yeah, Prof. Aglinda, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Po Hyung Hong yeah, from University of Science Malaysia. Hello, everyone. Hi, I hope everyone is um, staying safe yeah, uh, throughout this COVID crisis. Uh, thank you for joining us at this webinar, uh, which titled State and Community Responses to COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. Um, it is jointly organized by the School of Social Sciences, University of Science Malaysia, and the LaSalle University, particularly from the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, yeah, which is also called SEARCH. Yeah? Uh, for that, I'd like to express my gratitude to both Dr. Fernando Santiago, who is currently the director of SEARCH, and also Dr. Paul Hyung Hong, who, uh, you know, both of them has collaborated uh, very well. And uh, with this, we managed to present a interesting webinar series for today. And uh, my special appreciation to all speakers. Yeah, we have Dr. Sudir Manasir, Mr. Kim Hong Hyung, uh, Dr. Chloe Mosella, and uh, Dr. Ron Bridget Delok. Yeah, and I think um, everyone is um, expert in their own field and will be able to share with us um, some of their challenges and also what. Uh, their observation in terms of COVID-19 crisis. And I do wish that uh, everyone a full uh, intellectual disc uh, discourse and also discussion and uh, 
hope that we can have this kind of series uh, in more to come. Yeah, and um, I do not want to take more longer time. So I wish everyone a fruitful one, and I'll be joining uh, this seminar from beginning until the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Po, and everyone again. Thank you, Prof. Azilina. Uh, actually, Prof. Azilina has a very, very busy uh, schedule, huh? but uh, and she's still with us today, so uh, I'm very grateful. Oh, okay, now let me invite Dr. Fernando uh, Santiago. Uh, he's actually director of the LaSalle University's Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, uh, to say a few words. Uh, Dr. Fernando, please. Uh, he's also moderator of this webinar. Huh? Yeah, Dr. Fernando, please. Hello from Manila, Philippines. On behalf of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, also known as SEARCH of De La Salle University, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar on state and community responses to COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. This event, as mentioned, is jointly organized by SEARCH and the University Science Malaysia's School of Social Sciences. In fact, it is the first of a series of international webinars to be jointly organized by both institutions. I hope that you can also join us for our upcoming events. While we continue to face the challenges of COVID-19, we also observe an explosion of information on the internet. Circumstances have created conditions for scholars of the region to reach out to each other and to share their expertise with hope that in doing so, we can all better address the present challenges. I believe that this is the guiding spirit of our event. We are here together as a community of Southeast Asians with the common objective of effectively dealing with the present crisis. We are joined by distinguished speakers from Indonesia, Cambodia, and the Philippines. Dr. Suderman Nasir is at present in Makassar, Indonesia. Mr. Kim Kong Heng of Cambodia is at Queensland, Australia. Dr. Cleovi Mosuela is in Bielefeld, Germany, and Dr. Ron Vilog is in Manila, Philippines. My co-organizers, Dr. Por Hyong Hong and Dean Professor Aslinda Asaman are both in Penang, Malaysia. Our viewers are also watching from across the region. This is therefore a truly international event with the focus on Southeast Asia by Southeast Asians. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers for accepting our invitation and Professor Aslinda Azman, Dean of the School of Social Sciences, University of Science Malaysia, and Dr. Por Hyong Hong for jointly organizing this event with us. This event was the brainchild of Dr. Por, who also kindly agreed to be the MC and the moderator this afternoon. So Dr. Por, thank you for everything. So again, to everyone, welcome to the webinar and I wish you all a fruitful afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Fernando, for all your uh, generosity and kind words. Okay, now our webinar is going to start. Let me first introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Sudiman Nasio. Dr. Sudiman Nasio is a senior lecturer and researcher at the Faculty of Public Health uh, Universitas Hassanuddin in Makassar. He has conducted research on various issues related to drug use and HIV AIDS in Indonesia. He has been involved in drug use and HIV prevention programs in Indonesia since uh, the mid 1990s. Actually, our uh, Dean, uh, Prof. Azlinda, she's also an expert in uh, HIV and uh, AIDS prevention. Oh. Huh? Okay, sorry. And uh, Dr. Sudiman has also served as a Vice President of the Indonesian Young Academy of Sciences, ELMI, and is a 2019 Eisenhower uh, Fellow. He has a Bachelor in Medical Sciences from University, Universitas Hasanuddin and a Master's Degree and PhD from Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of uh, Melbourne. His title of speech today is COVID-19 in Indonesia, Multiple Vulnerabilities, Government and Community Responses. Uh, uh, please, Dr. Uh, Sudiman. And meanwhile, uh, for the audience, if you have any questions, please type in in the chat box or the Q&A box huh? uh, when, when, when the speakers speak. Okay, uh, thank, uh, please, uh, Dr. Sudiman, now is uh, pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Fernando, and also Professor Aslinda for uh, hosting us and enable the uh, webinar this uh, afternoon. 
The topic of my presentation is on COVID-19 in Indonesia, particularly in relation to multiple vulnerabilities, as well as government and community responses. And I think there are some uh, commonalities among countries in Southeast Asia region in relation to vulnerabilities and also to responses. But of course, there are also some uh, other factors that are unique in each uh, country. If you can see uh, and uh, provide assistance for me to uh, display the PowerPoint, I would like to uh, briefly discuss some of the issues uh, in relation to uh, the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah, in the next slide, I will discuss uh, some uh, factors uh, in relation to vulnerabilities that can be uh, categorized into two uh, different uh, vulnerabilities, uh, such as biomedical and also uh, social uh, vulnerabilities. As uh, we all understand that uh, countries in this region are, are severely uh, affected by uh, the pandemic, but Indonesia in particular uh, is among the most uh, severely hit by uh, the pandemic, as we can see in the current uh, cases that was reported uh, until yesterday, there are more than 200,000 uh, uh, cases. Uh, but we should be uh, cautious to this uh, formal data because it is most likely the tip of the iceberg under reporting uh, the actual uh, cases due to a uh, low level of uh, testing rate uh, in Indonesia. Our testing rate is uh, uh, lower compared even to some neighboring countries in uh, Southeast Asia. And also we uh, need to put into consideration the higher case fatality rate uh, in, uh, in the country. Uh, there are more than uh, 8,000 uh, deaths uh, at the moment or uh, around 4% uh, uh, case fatality rate, which is higher again compared to uh, uh, many other countries. And I would like to discuss some of the factors that influencing the particularly high fatality rate or high uh, death rate. One thing that uh, is very important is uh, the presence and the increased nature of comorbidities. And these comorbidities can be uh, categorized as one of the most important biomedical uh, vulnerabilities. Comorbidities is the existing uh, illness. Many of them are uh, non-communicable diseases, such as cardiovascular uh, diseases or heart diseases in lay term, and also diabetes mellitus. These two uh, diseases are the most uh, important comorbidities. They uh, can uh, push fatality rate into much uh, higher. And the risk factors that related to the emergence of these uh, two uh, comorbidities is hypertension and obesity. Indonesia's uh, basic health survey uh, in 2018 uh, confirmed the uh, significant or the sharp increase of these uh, two comorbidities. And uh, these comorbidities lead the people infected by uh, the new coronavirus to be uh, experiencing a more severe clinical uh, symptoms, or perhaps uh, you uh, are aware about the biomedical term of cytokine uh, storm, uh, when the body reacts to uh, defend uh, itself, it causes uh, a severe inflammation into many uh, important uh, or major uh, vital uh, organs that cause many uh, uh, worse uh, clinical symptoms, and this can be very severe and uh, lead to uh, premature death. And biomedical evidences uh, actually indicated very clearly the presence of many uh, uh, vulnerable groups. Male is uh, generally more susceptible to infection, but also uh, uh, people with uh, comorbidities as what I have uh, described and people with immunocompromised uh, systems, such as uh, the presence of uh, cancer, uh, particularly malign uh, cancer, 
and among people uh, with uh, older age or the elderly, and also people with disabilities and, and children. When these biomedical vulnerabilities uh, uh, clustering together with uh, social vulnerabilities, such as uh, low economic uh, background or poverty, the impact will be much more severe. In the next slide, uh, we can see some of the social vulnerabilities that link with biomedical vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. One of the important uh, factors that we need to see more closely is uh, hypertension. This is uh, an illustration of the sharp increase of hypertension in Indonesia, in which uh, go along uh, age. The older uh, an individual or a population group, uh, usually the high rate of hypertension also increase. And actually this kind of data related to hypertension is very common now in, in, in Southeast Asia. So this is not uh, uniquely uh, Indonesian case, and this is also not uniquely urban case, but also affecting people in the hinterland or in the rural areas. Another factor that I would like to uh, discuss is uh, uh, obesity, as can be seen in the next slide. In the next slide, you can also see uh, how uh, uh, obesity uh, increase uh, in uh, countries, uh, developing countries or middle income countries like Indonesia, they're affecting about one fifth of the population especially those uh, over uh, 18 years uh, old. This is also uh, a very uh, uh, common problem, not just in Indonesia, but in many other uh, middle-income countries uh, in, in Asia, uh, South America, and also uh, Africa. There is a saying that the, the globe is getting uh, fat, uh, or the term in, in global health now, the globesity. The, the, the globe is getting uh, obese, and this actually uh, put people uh, more susceptible to diabetes mellitus, to heart diseases, and then lead to uh, a more severe uh, clinical symptoms uh, uh, related to COVID-19. And there are also some alarming uh, uh, studies that people with this kind of risk factors are not uh, very... Uh, conducive to enjoy uh, benefits from the vaccine that we hope we can uh, uh, enjoy uh, at least uh, in the midterm of next year. In the next slide, we can see also the combination of this biomedical vulnerability with the vulnerabilities related to a uh, health system in, in Indonesia. One of the most important uh, factors is the low uh, level of health investment, particularly in preventative uh, uh, medicine. Compared to uh, neighboring countries such as Malaysia and Thailand, Indonesia's uh, investment, uh, investment for capita is much uh, lower. And this is one important factor that can uh, at least uh, partially uh, explain why uh, fatality rate in Indonesia is higher compared to Malaysia and, and Thailand. And we can also see uh, the vulnerabilities related to our uh, health system, such as uh, the hospitals and also the health workers. Indonesia only uh, has four doctors uh, and 12 uh, hospital beds for every uh, 10,000 uh, people. This is much lower compared to, to countries such as uh, Malaysia or Thailand uh, uh, let alone uh, uh, Singapore. So uh, when uh, COVID-19 patients increase sharply, this uh, health system uh, become uh, overwhelmed. And especially also uh, important for uh, the limited intensive uh, care beds uh, to treat people with uh, more severe uh, clinical symptoms. And as a result of this, in the context of the pandemic in Indonesia, we can see a very sad uh, phenomenon, uh, such as the death of many uh, medical doctors. Nowadays, uh, there are more than 100 medical doctors and also numerous uh, nurses and other health professionals uh, died uh, 
due uh, to COVID-19 and also due to fatigue because they are very tired dealing with the very sharp increase of uh, patients. In the next slide, we can also discuss some uh, of the non-biomedical factors, but also uh, significantly uh, affect uh, uh, the severity of type COVID-19. This is one of the examples in which inequality uh, plays a, a key role, uh, particularly in relation to uh, access to clean water. Uh, on average, only 74% of uh, Indonesia's population who have uh, access to clean uh, water, that uh, enable them to employ one of the most important preventative uh, uh, measure, uh, such as uh, washing hand with uh, uh, running water and also with, with soap. And also we should understand this uh, statistic uh, through interregional perspective, as uh, uh, we are aware that Indonesia is an archipelago, uh, more than 13,000 islands, and this interregional inequality particularly affects the eastern part of uh, the archipelago, such as Molucas Islands and, and Papua in the eastern part of uh, the country. In the next slide, I can uh, briefly show you some, uh, some data. Uh, uh, as I have mentioned, that in the eastern part of the country, uh, such as uh, Papua province, the access to a preventative uh, a measure uh, in the form of uh, access to clean water is only uh, around uh, 36%. Uh, uh, and as I said, this is really uh, hindering people's capabilities to employ uh, a key preventative uh, uh, behavior. In the next slide, we can also see some, uh, some other uh, socioeconomic uh, vulnerabilities, particularly the nature of Indonesia's uh, workforce. Uh, approximately 60% of uh, Indonesia's workforce actually work in the informal sector. And in this kind of informal economy, face-to-face uh, -face contact is uh, very uh, important and it is not uh, easily uh, change uh, uh, to online uh, uh, interaction. So for the people working in this kind of informal uh, economy, uh, it is very hard uh, for them to uh, comply with the uh, government uh, effort to employ uh, social and physical uh, distancing. Uh, there are many clusters of uh, infection around Indonesia's uh, uh, traditional markets in, in, in many cities in Indonesia, including in, in Makassar, in my uh, hometown. In the next slide, you can see some other uh, uh, data in relation to community and government responses. Most uh, countries in Southeast Asia are dealing with the uh, epidemic with... Uh, slower uh, or scattered uh, uh, sporadic uh, responses from the government uh, side. But uh, at least uh, after many uh, advocacy from uh, various health organizations, Indonesia's uh, national government acknowledged the first case in uh, early March uh, this year, actually wasting uh, around two months uh, to anticipate and to, pre to prepare themselves. Uh, around two months, the government at national and subnational level were trapped in a kind of uh, denial and underestimating the, the risk of COVID-19. But fortunately, at the community level, we can see a, a strong sign of uh, social capital, uh, such as uh, people's willingness to donate uh, to the less uh, fortunate or to donate to, to hospitals uh, overwhelming uh, situation. This is also uh, a very strong sign of volunteerism and, and uh, activism among Indonesia's uh, civil society. So uh, this is uh, perhaps the only good news and it's the current uh, epidemic. Uh, the epidemic also, uh, uh, interestingly for uh, colleagues in political science, uh, reveal one of the chronic problems in Indonesia after the down of uh, Suharto and the implementation of uh, the centralization uh, policy. 
such as a, a very fierce uh, political rivalry, they're actually uh, slowing down uh, or reducing the effectiveness of uh, government responses to, uh, to, uh, to the pandemic. The rivalries between uh, the national government with the provincial and city government are very uh, apparent at the moment, especially in the case of, uh, uh, of the conflict between uh, the president uh, camp uh, in the one side and the, the, the camp of the current governor of, of Jakarta, two, two uh, main actors in the current of political landscape in uh, Indonesia. And uh, the current COVID-19 also uh, provides such a very uh, important lesson learned that uh, investment in strengthening uh, health system, both national and subnational health system, is a prerequisite or a very important precondition to tackle the pandemic uh, uh, relatively uh, well. So in countries like Indonesia need to invest more in, in health, not just in hospital, but also in preventative measures such as managing better uh, chronic diseases, uh, for example, heart diseases and also uh, diabetes mellitus, as well as the risk factors such as uh, hypertension and obesity that increased very sharply in the last uh, 10 years. Another important uh, lesson learned is to invest in, in science infrastructure. Uh, the current low level of testing in Indonesia is uh, uh, a clear indication of the low level on, of investment, in, especially in, in capable laboratories in uh, Indonesia. Only very few uh, facilities, such as uh, the Aikman Institute in Jakarta, who are well prepared in, in conducting uh, a rigorous uh, uh, biomedical uh, research to support uh, uh, vaccine development, uh, for example, and also to try to uh, understand better the nature of, of the virus and the potential uh, treatment uh, to overcome the severe clinical uh, symptoms that we see, particularly among people with uh, comorbidities. These are uh, the lessons learned that I think many of them are applied to Indonesia, but some of them are also relevant in the context of uh, other countries in Southeast Asia uh, region. And in the next slide, I will, I will also uh, emphasize this uh, lesson learned that investing in this very vital uh, health system and, uh, and scientific uh, infrastructure is uh, a lesson learned for Indonesia that perhaps also can be applied in other uh, countries in, in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudiman. Uh, for keeping uh, in 20, min 20 minutes. Huh? So uh, I hope for those who have any questions, you can uh, always uh, write in uh, the Q&A box or uh, the chat box. Huh? Okay, uh, now, uh, thank you, Dr. Suleiman. And let me invite and introduce our second speaker, Mr. Kim Kong Heng, uh, who is currently in Australia. Uh, Kim Mr. Kim Kong is a doctoral uh, candidate in education at the University of Queensland, Australia. He's also a visiting senior fellow at the Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace and a co-founder of the Cambodian Education Forum. He has published several journal articles and book reviews as well as around 60 opinion pieces. I have read some of his, his opinion pieces, uh, including in the Atlantic, right? Uh, or did, did I get it? Wrongly, the, the, the which media and uh, his op eds have appeared in East Asia Forum Diplomat. Ah, sorry, I think it's Diplomat. Okay, the Interpreter, Nikkei Asian uh, Review, Phnom Penh Post, among others. The title of Mr. Kim, Kim Kong Heng's uh, presentation is Cambodia's COVID 19 Response Measures and Concerns. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Kim Kong Heng. Yes, thank you. So can you see my slide now? Uh, I can see it. I think everyone can see it. 
Okay, no, okay. So thank, thank you so much. And let me begin my presentation um, about Cambodian COVID-19 response. So I focus on major and concern. So before that, I start with the current situation about COVID-19 in my country. And as of yesterday or today, there were a total of 275 confirmed cases, and but only one case remained. The other have recovered. So 274 have recovered. Actually on the 11th of September this month, a few days ago, all COVID-19 cases have recovered. I mean, all the patients have recovered. So Cambodia was COVID-19 free, no COVID-19. But on the 13th, yesterday, or the, the day before yesterday, we got one more, one more case. So now we have only one active case and there have been no deaths in the beginning of the COVID-19. So that is uh, very good for Cambodia. And this is just the general de development of COVID-19 cases in, in my country, Cambodia. So we, we got the first COVID-19 case in January, the end of January, 27 January, the first one. And it took one month to get another case. So case two happened on 7 March. And then, however, it kept increasing in March. Did you see the diagram down here? Um, uh, in March, in one day, there, are, there were 30 cases. So 30 new cases. So the government uh, decided to, to close school, university in mid-March when there were 12 cases at a time. So cases keep increasing in March until about 100 at the end of March. And then it reached 122 at, in the middle of April. But from, from April, from 12 April to 20 May, so one month and one week, there were no new case at all. So, so all the 122 patients have recovered. So no, there, there were no COVID-19 case. I mean, no COVID-19 patient at the time, no COVID-19 in Cambodia on 16 May. I mean, on 16 May, you can see the ma uh, major milestone here, no COVID-19 case. So, however, one week later, we got one and two more cases. So cases uh, happened, uh, reached uh, 234 in July, at the end of July. So we got about one more hundred cases in two months from June and July. And the reason that we got more cases because the government of open fly. So everybody from overseas can go to Cambodia. So we, we just let let foreigner and Cambodian who live overseas come to Cambodia. So all the cases since June were or have been imported case. So there have not there have not been any community transmission of COVID nineteen in Cambodia yet. All the cases since June were or have been imported from overseas. And from August, the middle of August until twelve September. We have only one case. So this is, I think this is very impressive. One month, only one case. So we are, we kind of the best in Southeast Asia, I can say, um, because currently we, we have no deaths from COVID-19 and only one active case as of today. While the Philippines and Indonesia have a lot of cases, like a few or four, three or four thousand new cases every day. And so two, two major masters on 16 May, no case at all, COVID-19 free, uh, uh, 11 September again, COVID-19 free, but we got one or two or more cases along the way when, when uh, more and more people you know, go to Cambodia. So in, in, inside the country, there were no infection, no, no spread of the virus. So the virus from overseas and hopefully the government can still, you know, still can control the spread of COVID-19 to avoid uh, community spread. Because when you get commu community spread, it will spread 
more and more of that, which, which will be will not controllable. And the diagram here in March, in July and August, these are the three months that uh, have the, uh, there are more COVID-19. So I list down here all the measures that government begin to take from the beginning until now. So there are a lot of information, but I'm not going to talk all of them, just highlight a few uh, key measures that government take in, in order to control the spread of COVID-19. So we begin to, to fear, oh, initially uh, the government, Cameroon government uh, doesn't like, kind of downplaying the severity of COVID-19. So our, our Prime Minister, I think at the beginning of February, he went to China. He, want, he, he said that he wanted to visit student, Cameroonian student in Wuhan. Uh, but then China said, you cannot go to Wuhan at the, uh, in February when um, uh, COVID-19 was at its peak. So he could not go to Wuhan, but he went to Beijing. Uh, to meet a Chinese president and talk just, just to show that he support how China deal with COVID-19. So we actually initially downplaying COVID-19, but we begin to talk seriously about COVID-19 at the beginning of February. So on 11 February, we start talking about, we have committee discussing how to, to have control the spread of COVID-19. At the time, we had only one case, but we, we try to discuss how we can control because we know that if there will be more coming. So from that day on, uh, the government become uh, have a lot of measure, announcement, direction to the public, etc. And 7 May, one Cameroon was found uh, to have COVID-19 in Simbia province where Uncle Wat was located, but is located. So that when one man got infected, one Cameroonian man, the government decided to close all school in that province. So I think this is a very good measure because uh, uh, very quick, just one person infected and then we decided to close the, all the school in the province to prevent uh, COVID-19 spread. And the, the government announced that, okay, we have some reserve fund between 800 million to 2 billion to, to, to have uh, Cambodia uh, deal with COVID-19, for example, so we don't have a lot of money, but these are good that the government has some money, some some fun. And, and then also the government tried to control the spread of COVID-19 by uh, controlling how COVID-19 fake news spread. So anybody who sh share inaccurate information about COVID-19 will be, perhaps will be arrested, educated, Okay, ask why you, you, you share this, this spread, uh, spread this new, that's, which is not correct, for example. We close border, we, we, we not allow foreign, foreigner from some country which have uh, a lot of COVID cases like Italy, Germany, Spain, France at that time in March. And then school, all the school were closed in the country in 16 March. So in the middle of March, I think this happened to all country in, in not all, but most of the country in Southeast Asia. During March, uh, all, many countries started to close school and reopen later. There are many more measures, like we closed border between Cambodia and Vietnam, but Vietnam did it first. And we, we tried to control the spread from people who returned from Thailand in March, it was fortunate for Cambodia because in March about 10,000 migrants returned from Thailand because Thailand, most of, uh, I mean, business in Thailand were closed. So Cambodian migrants came back and we were lucky because when they came back, they, they did not have COVID-19. They, they came back, they go to their own village and the government cannot control them. I mean, everybody go to their own house, their own community. So what the government can do is just to make announcement that, okay, local authority, please go check with those people, try to ask them to quarantine, say isolated, et cetera. But luckily there were no COVID-19 spread in the community at the time. So we, we, we closed a beer garden, club, public transport, casino, 
So all the business, I think this is happening in other countries as well, so the same. At the beginning of April, Prime Minister said, okay, I will donate seven months of my salary. At the time, uh, he, he, he initiated that he would donate his salary to support the a committee who, who helped to combat COVID-19. So when he announced that, other officials follow him. So some donate seven months, some donate six months of their salary, some donate three months, some donate one month. So from senior officer to teacher to all civil servants try to help the country. This is good, this one. So we got about, I think, more than 20 million from people who donate in the country. And in abroad, we supposed to celebrate our new year, Khmer New Year, we, we celebrated for three days, but the government decided to cancel celebration to, to control COVID-19. So I think this is also a very good measure because if we allow the, the Khmer New Year to take place, I mean, people to celebrate New Year, they will go back to their home, home hometown, yeah? So they might bring COVID-19 from the city to their family in the province, in the rural area. So we uh, government decide to, to cancel it. And then there are more measures, one of which is that during, uh, during in, in April, we, we have domestic travel restriction. The government said, okay, one week for one week during command new year. I mean, new year will, will cancel, but people still want to go to their own country because every once a year, we have to go to our, our family in the province or our hometown to celebrate New Year. Even the government can solve it, people still want to go. So the government say, okay, this week during Khmer New Year, we cannot travel across district or across provinces. You have to stay where you are. You, you can only stay in your city or in your province or in your district, cannot move out of your district for one week. But still, when, when, when they announced that, one day before the, the announcement, one day before the restrict restriction uh, uh, come into effect, people at that night, they went to their own their, their province. So that was funny. So one week after that, they come back. So all those who come back, especially those who work in the uh, garment factory, uh, uh, we, they have to be tested and quarantined to ensure that they don't have COVID-19 when they come back from the province. And the end of April, we have state of emergency law that I will talk about concern later on about this one. We passed a state of emergency law that, that try to restrict people's rights to communicate or to expect concern about different things, for example. So from mid-May, we start to reopen museum, casino, and everything. We start to reopen because during mid-May, were, we were COVID-19 free at that time. However, in June and July, there are more cases coming. So 1st of August, Cambodia suspend fly from Indonesia and uh, Malaysia because these two countries at the time have a lot of COVID-19 infection. So we, we try to prevent people from Indonesia and Malaysia. Otherwise, uh, they will bring, when, when, when Cambodian living there come back, they will bring COVID-19 with them. And on 11 August, we close we suspend flight from the Philippines as well because the, the Philippines also become a hot spot of COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. And however, in the middle of August, we celebrate our new year. So it was delayed from April to August. This is very interesting. Uh, during August, when we celebrate our Khmer New Year, there were 30 active cases. So people just go to their province and celebrate their their holiday, they go to different provinces. It's like no more actually. So, but they still protect themselves by wearing masks, etc. But, however, uh, it seemed like COVID nineteen were under control at that time. So, it, it was lucky that there there have not been any new cases or any uh, uh, transmission uh, community in the community. And schools start to re reopen now in, in my country. I, I'm not sure about other countries in Southeast Asia, but we start to, OT, to reopen some school uh, for in Cambodia, grade nine and grade 12 for some school that can start reopen. So students who, who study grade nine, grade 12 can go to study. 
there are other measures which has been done and I think this is the same in other countries like testing, contact tracing, and check people when they come back from overseas, isolation, quarantine, etc. So this uh, uh, the same. But one thing I want to uh, emphasize is about press conference by the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Health. So once a week, they, are, they, are, they have press conference explaining people about the situation happening in the country, how to protect the people. So I think this is very useful. People kind of feel more confident what happening in the country. So they are, then they, are, they got actual information from the ministry. And we have cracked down on COVID-19 that I will talk about this later. So what explain Cambodian COVID-19 success? I can say it's a success because we have only one case at the moment, but the success may be temporary. I mean, we don't know what, uh, what will happen next, but currently we have success about COVID-19. So this, I list all the factors here in one slide. So I'm sorry about the information in just one slide, that's too much, but I just want to include everything in one slide. Okay, so factor that contribute to success, most are also done in other country, like we got testing, contract testing, or contract, contact tracing, suspension of foreign visa, and in call of border of flights, and domestic travel, we cannot travel across the province, for example, that was temporary, and extensive screening at border points, quarantine, cancel some holiday, or some celebration, like I think in, in Malaysia during March, I'm not sure the day, but they have religious event. After the, the event, people gather in in the church, etc. And then after that, a lot of cases, even some of them got infected and came to Cambodia. Uh, those who uh, who were Muslim, Cham in, in Cambodia, we call Cham. So, a lot of people from from, but luckily they they go to their own village, but still they did not we don't have any spread in the community. So I I think it, it kind of lucky for Cambodia. However, there are a few a few points that I want to note here. We got a lot of support from World Health Organization, from local donor and international partner like the US, the EU, Japan, China. I think. I think uh, other countries in Southeast Asia also got uh, support from different partners as well. So I, I can say that I might, uh, there's no research on this, but I think um, that some one or two factors that contribute to success is that a lot of people in my country live in the province, like 80% are still living in, in the province. So that kind of natural isolation, so people do not spread wider to each other because they live far from each other and they're kind of living their own farming life. They go to the farm rather than go to the city, go to a town, for example. So we don't spread virus to each other. And we are accustomed to wearing masks because in our country, we have kind of dust around. When you go out, you some people, they prefer to wear masks. So this has a lot when we have COVID-19 because people are used to wearing masks. So when when the government says, okay, everybody, please wear a mask, they already have, have already wear one mask. So no problem for them. Just buy more masks and wear it. And two thirds of, of the population are under 35. So they are young. And I think when they are young, they have good immune system to fight COVID-19. So I kind of feel that, oh, maybe we are accustomed to dust accustomed to germ and accustomed to kind of virus. So COVID-19 is just one virus. So maybe we can protect our immune system can have. So we don't know, but might be, you know, might be this is good that we have immune system. We have uh, kind of get used to some dirt, some dust, etc. But uh, this is just uh, my own opinion. Uh, there's no research yet. So all these are kind of uh, factor that contribute to success. And one more is leadership factor. I feel it's also important because uh, the government is under, I mean, everything is under control. The government have power to decide quickly. So when they want to close school, let's close school. When they don't want to do this, they do this. So quickly, so quickly, 
this quick decision have a lot to control uh, the spread of COVID-19 because you are allowed just one or two days to, to, for the virus to spread, it will spread very quickly, so cannot control. And okay, one more slide for concern. And there are a lot of concerns, but I think these are some of the key concerns. The first concern is about state of emergency law that was passed in April. The law allowed the government more power to restrict freedom to expression, freedom to communicate freely. The government can take your belonging, your possession, can look at your conversation on the phone, etc. So the government has a lot of power to uh, to, to control people' movement, control people' freedom. I mean, if you do something that can contribute to uh, uh, chaos, social chaos, or like social national peace or stability, you can be fined or arrested and imprisoned, etc. So this this is one concern. And the government just say, okay, if you spread fake news, you will be arrested. This is problematic because some people who are like, they don't like the government, for example, or they are supporting the opposition, they are usually tend to say something critical of the government about COVID-19, about corruption, or about something else. So if you say something else or about COVID-19, you might be arrested. Who's no, because we get, we have crackdown on COVID-19 fake news. So people get arrested, a lot of people, so I think according to Human Rights Watch, about 100 people were arrested during uh, into in the first half of 2020 when COVID-19 came. A lot of people were arrested. Some are uh, still in jail. Some uh, some were released. So crackdown on dissent and government critique the same. School closures, schools remain closed, and it affects children, parents. So like the previous presenter, Dr. Sudiman uh, presented about uh, impact of COVID-19. So we have, when school were closed, some private school go bankrupt because they cannot generate income, gen generate when revenue to support their expenses. Parents have to look after children. They cannot go to work because the children stay home. So teacher lose salary because some teacher, because we teach online, they cannot get paid full. They get only half or 75% of their salary. And entertainment, entertainment venue still closed. So people who work in that area become unemployed. And the government gives $70, $70 a month to government, a government worker and people who work in the tourism sector. $70 a month, can you survive in your country or in Cambodia? So this is the problem, very big concern. 99.5% 90, drop in revenue for ticket to Angkor Wat. So this is because tourism is one of the major contributor to Cambodia GDP. So now we don't have a, we don't have visit oh, uh, uh, tourists for this problem. Our country was projected to, our economy was projected to fail and to contract between 1% to 5.5%, so below zero, one to 5% below zero. This is a, a projection by the World Bank and ADB. And one special thing is that we got impacted by COVID-19 and then we got a partial EBA withdrawal. If you have follow situation in Cambodia, uh, the EU give us EBA uh, benefit we can export freely to the EU without tax. Now they say, okay, 20% of your export have to pay tax. Because why? Because the EU think that Cam Cambodia democracy has gone backward. So we another concern is about our democracy, and I think this is happening in other country in Southeast Asia too. It's a very big concern uh, throughout the region. But Cambodia now is very kind of okay. We go back we, before we have two big party, ruling party and opposition party, but now opposition party was dissolved. Only one party, one man party. There are 
like 20 other small party, but they're kind of useless because they're just participate for the case for the sake of participation, but they cannot get any vote. So in 2018, uh, uh, all there were all the seat, all the parliamentary seat were won by the ruling party. And we have cracked down recently, last month or this month, we have cracked down on youth and environmental activists. Just one month since in August until now, 15 youth and activists were arrested. And this will keep going because in July, uh, one prominent union leader were arrested because he talked about border issue between Cambodia and Vietnam. He was arrested. So youth and other people think that why we talk about border issue, about issue in our country and you are arrested. So they are trying to protest for the release of that union leader. And then they, all, they are also arrested. Now nobody want to protest. If you protest, you are arrested. Government say if one come, arrest one. That's it. And so what's next? Post COVID-19 Cambodia. So there are a lot of things that we need to consider for Cambodia. So I think it's more than just economic recovery. Every country, every country wanted to, to recover uh, from COVID-19, even now we have COVID-19 or after COVID-19. But for Cambodia, there are a lot of things to do because we're still a poor country. And so first I think we need to increase productivity agricultural productivity or manufacturing productivity, diversify our export market. Currently, we have done a lot about uh, diversifying our export market. We have signed pre-trade agreement with China, with other countries like Japan. We're thinking about that as well, South Korea as well. But there are more to be done in terms of diversifying our export market. And we need to invest in education because our education is still uh, it compared with a, its country in Southeast Asia, we still low. In terms of research, I think number eight in Southeast Asia, check uh, based on uh, publication in Scopa Index Journal, we are at number eight. And I think Malaysia is number one, and we have Singapore and Philippines following Indonesia, etc. Thailand is revitalize our agriculture sector. We are an agricultural country, but our agriculture is still underdeveloped. So I, I don't know what to say because we claim that we are an agricultural country, but our, our agricultural is still uh, not advanced yet. Improve si uh, services in tour tourism sector. I think this is happening in other, other countries as well. We need to uh, improve service in, but in my country, we have Angkor Wat, which is very good. Uh, to reach destination, we need to, you know, build on that. You know, find way to make sure people come and spend and their money. Adopt greater technology transfer. We still need this. This is the era of fourth industrial revolution. So we need to work more on technology transfer. I think this is happening in other countries as well, not just in Cambodia. Promote SME. Yeah, we need to have more small business uh, to to help the country recover from COVID-19, improve competitiveness. I think my country was ranked about 110 or 112 among 141 country. So we need to try to improve competitiveness to make it like Singapore. Singapore is number one. And even, even other countries in Southeast Asia also have to try to improve their own competitiveness. Yeah, follow Singapore. <laughs> Sorry to say that. So is you land grabbing, corruption, cronism, social injustice. This is very critical issue that, that constrain country de development. And this is happening in, in Southeast Asia, other country too. Reverse democratic drift. This is very important because when you drift away from democracy, all democratic country had you stop giving you money so you are a poor country so you do like that you how can you survive so this is if it look like a family business like oh you you got support from other but you don't do things that 
make other want to support you. So this is very big issue. Adopt a balanced and flexible foreign policy. And I think you are following politics and international relations. You are aware of what's happening in Southeast Asia in terms of South China, South China Sea, China, Philippines, Vietnam, so other countries in South, Southeast Asia. And, and Cambodia is not a climate non-climate state. So we kind of get away from Southeast Asia, South China Sea. So we, you know, there are issues, there are accusa accusations that we kind of align to China at the expense of country in Southeast Asia. So I need, I think my country need to adopt a balanced and flexible foreign policy in terms of this one to, to, to make sure that country is Southeast Asia still look at Cambodia nicely and feel good about Cambodia, not like what happening in 2012 and, and in other. So this is the end of my presentation. I have a few articles here that I have written about COVID-19 success in Cambodia and other issues. So thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. Okay. Uh Thank you, uh, Mr. Kim Kong King. Uh, compared to the Philippines and Indonesia, we actually really know very little about the situation in Cambodia. It seems like even though uh, Cambodia has uh, uh, controlled the pandemic uh, very well, but uh, the post-pandemic challenges uh, has a lot to, uh, for, for, for Cambodia to handle. Uh? Okay, <laughs> and uh, yeah, meanwhile, uh, there are some questions already for, I think for you and for Dr. Sudiman, can you please check uh, the chat box and the Q&A box? Uh, because uh, there are audience who are throwing questions already, throwing in questions. Please check the Q&A box and the chat box. Huh? And now we have come to the uh, third session of this webinar, which has two panelists. Uh, we invite the first panelist, uh, Dr. Quilby, before uh, Dr. Ron uh, join us. So uh, Dr. Quilby uh, Mosula is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center on Migration, Citizenship and Development, Faculty of uh, Sociology, Bielefeld University in uh, Germany. Um, sorry, there's something, okay. Um, her research interests include migration mobility, uh, its relationship with labor, environmental change, development and security, decolonization and care ethics. She's currently working on a project on migrant precariousness and caring practices in the context of climate change. She has recently published her first book entitled Recuperating the Global Migration of Nurses. Uh, Quil uh, Dr. Quilby, please, uh, now uh, is your time. Hi. Yes, um, thank you very much for that introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Well, good morning from Germany. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to uh, the organizers, uh, Dr. Tor Hyung Hong, um, Dean Aslinda Asman, and Dr. Fernando Santiago. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be in conversation with, with you and the first two speakers. Um, yeah, so a little bit about myself. I'm a postdoctoral researcher with a background in sociology and political science, uh, which I actually finished at De La Salle University. So that's uh, my first connection with um, De, De La Salle. Um, and I have two public writing um, entries discussing the pandemic with a social science lens and um, qualitative research. Um, and for this talk today, um, it's a, collaborat a collaborative research conducted with Dr. Ron Gilog of DLSU. Um, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen. So, um, okay. Um, so, um, let me say a little bit on, on how our talk relates to the theme of the webinar series on state and community responses. We are specifically talking about international migration governance. Um, and healthcare work, the connection between the two. Um, and in fact, Dr. Nasir, the first speaker, already uh, mentioned the precariousness of health system in Indonesia. And we are sort of echoing that concern of um, precariousness of health system in the Philippines or of the Philippine healthcare system. 
and Mr. Hang, the second speaker, already mentioned that um, the pandemic measures, there are more than, more than just an issue of e economic recovery. So it's a social science, a uh, social um, concern as well. Um, and in our respective research endeavors, Dr. Ron and I, we have argued that nurse migration from um, under-resourced to developed countries perpetuates the dispensability of care and the expendability of Filipino nurses on a global scale. Um, so the pandemic manifests the flaws of this migration system. And our focus on migration also engages with a changing definition of community, which goes beyond the borders of a nation state. Migrants, including Philippine trained nurses, maintain relations with their family back home back in the Philippines or other forms of relations, maybe political, social, other relations that connect them with the Philippines. And these relations inform us of transnational practices and that the relations between states and communities shift. So in fact, our understanding of state and community responses is informed by um, a transnational lens. And here's how we, uh, we will proceed. I will first contextualize Filipino nurses migration and then provide um, stories of Filipino nurses working in the front line of COVID-19 care in German hospitals. Um, and then Dr. Ron Vila will speak about the Philippine state responses, um, the nursing community responses and further policy implications. So numerous scholars and international organizations in the cross-border migration field, including government agencies, have in fact varying sentiments on the almost 50-year governance of cross-border migration from the Philippines. And many of these actors frame the apparatus as the governance model to emulate by other third world labor export countries. Sociologists from the US like Ana Romina Guevara and Robin Rodriguez expose a labor brokering mechanism enabled by the Philippine state, which is very much embedded in its colonial history, particularly as related to the United States colonial labor system, which laid out the blueprint for generating a kind of labor export economy as an expression of managing the population of the Philippines. And the migration of US trained Filipino nurses to American hospitals, for instance, is an example of the historical legacy of colonialism by establishing public health nursing in the Philippines, which enabled the formation of, an, of convenient, cheap, gendered, and racialized workforce to provide the needs for the then imperial power and now um, to provide needs of the labor market. And this export of Filipino nurses causes problems in the Philippine healthcare system and the, man the pandemic again manifests um, these problems. Nurses are overburdened with patients. Paradoxically, paradoxically there are hundreds of thousands of unemployed nurses. Um, there are not many positions open in hospitals and the salaries are below the family living wage. And the literature would call this uh, drivers of migration. But going beyond um, these push factors, uh, well, I'll present a couple of stories which um, constitute means for uh, actors to express and negotiate the migration experience. Um, and again, this is a transnational lens. So um, I will talk about their migration experience in connection with um, their home in the Philippines. So Filipino nurses working in the front line of COVID-19 care in German hospitals migrated through a bilateral agreement enacted in 2013 called the Triple Win Project. And the idea behind that agreement is to fill Germany's nursing shortage. And this is actually a familiar story. You've heard about this um, in Canada or um, in the US um, or in the UK. Uh, so, so in fact, um, our approach has been um, through stories which can provide insights into how migrant frontliners seek to make sense of 
um, diverse risks they face placed in broader social, political, and cultural contexts. And for us as researchers as well, uh, stories better account for nuances in sensitive material. So um, first thing I'll talk about is um, heightened precariousness at COVID-19 station. We all know that the um, coronavirus is a moment of um, rupture that creates new worlds of uncertainty. And given that nurses are responsible for primary care of patients, which means feeding, bathing, helping patients move. There is a lot of physical contact. They are nervous taking on the job, knowing that what they're facing is new and fatal. And they have this physical or corporeal bodily experience of the intensity of coronavirus, whether in the Philippines or abroad. And they ask themselves a lot of what ifs, what if I get infected? What if I unknowingly pass, pass it on, which for instance, kept one nurse awake for five straight nights, um, would question herself, is it a blessing to be a nurse during the pandemic? What if I die, but maybe it is better to die doing what you're supposed to be doing as a nurse? Another aspect of precariousness, precariousness that comes with being a migrant is the complexity of relations of care that connect individuals and families across societies. With coronavirus spread in different parts of the world, the dangers of caring at a distance become even more pronounced. So there is a question now of what it means to care when family members living apart across national borders are all exposed to the virus. So there's the risk of dying far from home, but far from your loved ones. So these nurses at German hospitals, they are facing high, high risk of, of dying far away from their loved ones. One of their concerns is what would happen to their family in the Philippines if they die in Germany. They are supporting their families back in the Philippines. And on the other, and the other way around as well, of being far from home, um, for instance, um, your family in the Philippines, they're also exposed to the virus. So how can you take that when you're um, a migrant worker? Um, another example, um, one nurse who learned about the positive um, test result said, um, when he contracted the virus while working at the coronavirus station. Um, he said that he did not panic, but he had just so many questions in mind. He was living alone and his family is back in the Philippines um, and they kept in touch through social media, through online communication. His parents and friends and relatives were all worried, um, texting him every day. Um, and he said that it was a very emotional experience for him. For three weeks, he was dependent on um, a web of care uh, composed of friends um, looking after him, doing the groceries and buying medicine. Um, and also luckily uh, the local health department was calling him every day to check on his vitals. But after getting better, he went to work again for COVID-19 patients. Um, he is, um, what is inspiring, I think, for, uh, about his story is that he's sharing his story through social media and is able to inspire his network of friends. Um, he uses his story to tell people in his hometown in the Philippines to, um, to send positive messages like you can you can get over this and we you know just stay calm and but be, be very cautious so imagine that kind of um, connection and that kind of um, far away distance but still able to um, sort of influence um, people from from his hometown uh, there's also one story of, of one nurse um, who uh, did not or could not inform his mother living in Manila about his decision to volunteer as a COVID-19 care nurse. 
he knew his mother would be worried and even angry. So he could already feel um, the intensity of his mother's emotions, even though they're living miles away from each other. Uh, but so he told her only after a week of working. And when he became confident that the double protective suit, visor, face mask, gloves would be enough to keep him safe from the virus. When he finally told his mother, the mother could not sleep, uh, worried of him. And um, he sent her pictures just to calm her down, he sent her pictures of him wearing protective, um, personal protective equipment. And the mother interestingly would compare it to images of what she saw on TV from China, for instance, where healthcare workers are fully covered with hazmat suit. And she was still even um, very worried. Uh, well, he had to explain the standard in Germany, um, which he trusts and reassured her that he actually felt safe at his um, station where he knew his patients tested positive. And the mother just you know, had to accept it at the end. So um, I think it's interesting, these negotiations happening across distance um, and these relations changing um, across distance. Um, so yeah, that's what I've uh, basically um, talked about precariousness and transnational practices, which are, um, we think are important aspects of international migration experience and also um, um, important in terms of talking about pandemic responses. And now we move on to Philippine state and nursing community responses with uh, Dr. Vilog. Okay, uh, let me introduce Dr. Vilok. Okay, Dr. Ron Bridget Vilok is an, uh, uh, thanks uh, Kyovia for very um, touching and rich human voices uh, in your presentation. Huh? Now, uh, let me introduce Dr. Ron Bridget Vilok. Um, he is an associate professor and former chairperson of the International Studies Department of the La Salle University. He obtained his PhD in International Development from the Graduate School of International Development of Nagoya University in Japan through the Mombukaga Kusho Scholarship Program. Dr. Bilok has written research papers on the migration uh, dynamics of Filipino workers in Japan and has also conducted narrative research on Filipino Nikkejin and factory workers in Aichi, Aichi Prefecture. Uh, Dr. Vilok, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, uh, Ron. Thank All right. You. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cleo V, uh, for, the, for making sense of the narratives that we collected um, in Germany. So basically my task here, uh, I, I'll try to shorten this. My task here is uh, to talk about the state responses and some of the policy implications that we can discuss as these experiences of frontliners, as, uh, as, as the experiences of frontliners that Dr. Cleo V. Mosuela um, uh, mentioned a while ago. One of the most important issues that we need to talk about now is, uh, of course, in the Philippines, we have the deployment ban. So the, the Philippine government through POEA uh, they declare that in compliance with the national interagency directives, uh, the deployment of Filipino health care workers shall be strictly regulated to prioritize and provide support to the health care needs of the country during the pandemic. So in principle, this is a um, uh, 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 deployment ban, which is basically a policy that uh, should be say, it's a policy that traps thousands of nurses in their home country and we know that, you know, in this, this principle, uh, the principle behind this is to prioritize the healthcare needs of the country. In the next few months of the pandemic, we've seen hundreds of nurses being infected in their workplaces, and that really paralyzed the medical force. However, we have to remember that this ban is clearly against the principles of labor justice. Thousands of these nurses have underwent rigid training, they passed exams, and they really practiced various internship programs in preparations for the deployment. But uh, of course, they are all aspiring for a greener pasture, 
but unfortunately they cannot leave the country now. On another perspective, we need to remember that the destination countries of these nurses, like Germany, for instance, they're also expecting our nurses uh, to, be, to be there, to work there. So their health systems are also affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's why they develop mechanisms like the triple win that uh, Cleovi mentioned a while ago. Uh, it's basically um, a mechanism to make sure that uh, they have a pool of manpower to address these kinds of shortages. So yeah, that's one of the uh, one of the main response of one of the main responses of the Philippine government um, amid the COVID nineteen pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, Cleo V, can you move the slide? Yeah. Um, All right. It's not working. Okay. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait. Oh, it's stuck. Oh. Can you? Okay. Can you, um, go on. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Um, well, Cleo V is fixing it. Maybe I can just, um, in the interest of time, I, I'll just try to synthesize and probably summarize some of the implications of the um, of the narratives that she mentioned and the situation of the Filipino nurses amid COVID nineteen pandemic. So the first one we want to to emphasize that um, Filipino nurses are really in integral part of the global COVID nineteen response. The Philippine nursing sector is a part of the medical community, of the global medical community within and outside the country. And they're actually occupying significant positions in large and um, small hospitals. And they are indeed the frontliners of the emergency and COVID section. So it's uh, very important that we understand that they are an integral part of the COVID-19 response um, not only in the Philippines, but actually in the international community. Uh, second is, uh, still not working? Okay, all right. Second, we want to, to argue that uh, there is really, uh, a, there is really this experience of disempowerment experienced by our Filipino nurses uh, this empowerment occurs when nurses are not equipped with capacities to fulfill their duties and to contribute to the global health community. This empowerment, this empowerment is clearly imposed by the state, depriving them of their liberty to choose their workplace and even to fulfill their dreams. It's actually um, sad to share this story, but a few months ago, the Philippine president mentioned that you know our health workers were actually let me just quote him. Uh, he was saying that uh, health workers were lucky to die in the, ser in the service of the country. Of course, there are criticisms, say, criticisms or critics saying that this kind of veneration of workers are actually designed to, you know, to, um, um, to undermine the agency of the, of the health, health workers and, of course, to obscure the government's failing or failing policies. So uh, we also want to, to, uh, to, to uh, mention that uh, this empowerment, as mentioned by the narratives, no, it's also caused by lack of protection. We had to deal with the lack of you know, test kits, not only for the patients, but also protective equipment or protective uh, PPEs for workers on the front line when they were battling the coronavirus. Um, and then the third, okay, so uh, because we have no PowerPoint presentation, okay, let me just mention or, or let me just um, emphasize some of the themes that we want to, uh, we want to argue or we want to discuss for, um, for further debate or further discussion. The third is we want to make, to, to emphasize that Medical brain drain 
really needs to be further explored and discussed in the policy circles. So what really causes brain drain? Is it really, you know, we used to say that, it's just, uh, that this is caused by the culture of migration in the Philippines or the general behavior uh, that the Filipinos have um, about, you know, exploring opportunities outside the country. Uh, what can prevent them from leaving? Clearly, studies have indicated that uh, a significant percentage of overseas Filipino workers would actually prefer to stay in the home country if given just benefits and compensation. So I think uh, we need to emphasize that, um, uh, you know, um, that now the, uh, the, this is a more serious issue because in the past, we used to argue that uh, that there was really no medical brain drain in the Philippines. We used to say that we had shortages of experience in assistant nurses, but we have a lot of nursing graduates, so we have no brain drain. But now it's a different story. We lack nurses to serve the hospitals and communities amid COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, And then um, also we want to emphasize that there is this issue of compensation, benefits, protection. Local nurses in the Philippines, they earn about 15,000 to 20,000 a month, depending on the institution, depending also on the area. Uh, but you know, we, have to, we have to compensate them well and to protect them. Um, we have to ask the state or the, the um, we have to, uh, to, to appeal not only to the legislators, but to the, uh, to the government implementers about you know, giving them enough support during the pandemic, give them um, extra compensation and benefits because they were risk risking lives on the front line. And then um, Dr. Masuela also mentioned a while ago about triple win, this bilateralism. We just want to, make, to emphasize that, uh, that if migration is properly coordinated and managed by both host and sending countries, that would somehow lessen the risks and disempowerment that they may experience. So as the narratives of the nurses in Germany suggest, trust to the government agencies is actually very important. Okay, And finally, we want to... Um, we want to uh, mention that uh, this is really uh, all these issues, all these, um, all these uh, discourses would actually lead us to the to the con to the concept to the principle of migration gover governance. The pandemic has really revealed that there are crises that we need to address in the governance of migration in the, the Philippines. So as we uh, we can we can uh, witness or we can experience these policies are actually very active as it attempt to fix the current problems while disregarding future issues and problems. Okay, so I think that's my part, but uh, I just uh, want to uh, to to conclude this by uh, emphasizing what Dr. Mosuela claimed or um, argued a while ago that nurse migration from under-resourced to developed countries perpetuates the dispensability of care and the expendability of Filipino nurses on a global scale. And the pandemic has exposed the flaws of this system. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mosuela and Dr. Vila for a fascinating presentation. Uh, I uh, now is time for Q&A. Actually, I already have some questions, uh, but I'll keep it for later. And then uh, uh, let's look at some of the Q&A. Uh, there's a, in the Q&A session, there is one uh, audience, his name is uh, uh, Kamaruddin Mohammad. Uh, meanwhile, uh, can I invite uh, Dr. Fernando to join us back if uh, he, uh, uh, because uh, he's one of the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. Uh, so doc, uh, this the one audience, Kamaruddin Muhammad, he's asking, uh, I think this question is for uh, Mr. Kim Kong Heng. 
with he asked uh, with the low case recorded in Cambodia, the keyword that came into his mind is immunity. Yeah? Is strong immunity a main factor in the case of Cambodia? If so, what could be the possible variables that boost Cambodians? immunity this sounds like a very biomedical question rather than a social yeah. science yeah? <laughs> yes yeah, yes uh, um i i i don't have a study in that area but i just share my personal opinion like i i already mentioned in the slide i suspect that we we have good immunity uh first a lot of people are young like i mentioned two thirds of the population uh, under 35, so young people have good immune system compared to older one. Secondly, we been accustomed or get used to living in environment that environment that sorry environment that like full of dust and stuff, germ etc. So kind of this strengthen our immune system as well. So when COVID nineteen come, we can deal with that. For example, just just like a joke, but can be true if we study on that. And we wear masks frequently before COVID nineteen. We we wear masks, so it's not a problem to wear masks in public or at workplace. So this this help protects people from getting infected. And in terms of uh, strong immune system. I, I seen studies saying that we have gone through a number of viruses or disease. Um, and then people have taken a lot of medicine to, or they have been injected uh, when they were born or later on. So this has strengthened their immune system as well. So I think all this factor and other factor as well, like, like, like the way that people living, more, more people living in the provinces not in the city and people wear masks, so this help uh, uh, protects, uh, control the spread of the virus. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Kim Kong Heng, uh, for answering the Q&A. Uh, there is another question for Dr. Sudiman. Uh, this comes from Facebook, uh, 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 an audience from uh, Siang Bojia. He asks, uh, do you think infrastructure development can decrease the risk of uh, social economic vulnerability, since it might connect the West and the East of Indonesia closer economically. Uh, Want to hear your opinion? Yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. And uh, I think for uh, the longer term, uh, infrastructure development, uh, a priority of the current Joko Widodo's administration, potentially. Uh, reduce uh, socioeconomic vulnerability. And actually, before the pandemic, uh, we start to see the decline of poverty level, including inequality level measured by Gini uh, index. But uh, this uh, significant achievement uh, were uh, damaged by the, the pandemic. And uh, we also now start uh, discussing in Indonesian context about the need for the government to balance the priority for infrastructure development or economic priority uh, uh, development with uh, better investment in human uh, capital. Uh, the current Indonesian decentralization policy put uh, a lot of burden to the subnational government to invest uh, and strengthen the local health system or education system in which uh, it, it was not as what we imagined in 1998 after uh, the, the end of the very centralized uh, policy under uh, Suharto's new order. So uh, some balance between uh, focus on infrastructure uh, development with investment in health, education, and also in, in, in higher education is very uh, important to facilitate a further uh, decrease in poverty and inequality, including uh, transforming, transforming the current economic uh, uh, or workforce uh, structure, which is still very dominant on the uh, informal economy transforming uh, the economy into a more formal economy, as well as providing uh, policies uh, for uh, 
uh, provinces in the eastern part of uh, Indonesia in tackling uh, structural issues such as access to uh, clean water, access to electricity, and now access to internet connection because the pandemic also facilitate a distant uh, learning. While this is okay for the uh, well-to-do uh, population or the, uh, the middle class, this uh, distant uh, learning affects the lower uh, middle class and the poor people very severely yeah, in terms of education. And this, of course, will affect the, uh, their future if the government uh, at all levels uh, do not uh, fix the current inequality to, uh, to internet uh, connection, clean water, uh, electricity, and, and, and uh, decent uh, employment. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Suleiman. Uh, here, uh, so all audience, uh, I would like to encourage uh, you to type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. Huh? Uh, meanwhile, I actually have one question for Mr. Kim, uh, Kim Kong. Huh? I wonder what's the, uh, how has, um, what's the role of international funder during this uh, pandemic huh? in, in, in Cambodia in terms of uh, how the pandemic affect international funding? At one sense, okay. At another level, international funding uh, does it have anything to do with uh, uh, contributing to the uh, to to this preventing this pandemic? These are two two different. How the pandemic affect international funding, and then how international funding affect uh, the prevention on the ground in, in in the case of Cambodia. Yeah, thank you for the question. And what I can uh, say is that Cambodia is a poor country, uh, a small developing state. So we need help from other partner around the world to help Cambodia fight against COVID-19. So our healthcare system is still poor. So we need support. So the, the World Health Organization provide technical support that's very important, how to, to deal with COVID-19, for example, how to test, how to uh, uh, do self quarantine on other, other important issue. And we got support from the World Bank, $20 million to, to help fight COVID-19, and support from a lot of other country, um, Japan, China, Vietnam, um, the EU, Germany, the US, so Australia. So there are a lot of countries that have uh, helped Cambodia fight COVID-19. So through, through technical, uh, te so technical support is one, um, financial support is another, and there is one more that which is about medical supply. So through masks, through other uh, PPE equipment, so these are very important for, for Cambodia. So we can buy more equipment for our doctor, our nurses to, to, to uh, uh, treat uh, people who got infected. I have written an article on the diplomat about the title is who, who is, who's helping Cambodia uh, fight COVID-19. So that, that article, I list all the, the, the development partner and all the issue around what foreign aid that happened during the COVID-19 uh, COVID that how can how can we benefit from uh, from uh, foreign uh, I mean from foreign aid or international development partner yeah thank you okay uh, thank you uh, Mr Kim Kong and uh, I would also like to exercise my uh, power as a moderator. I have a question for uh, the, the third and the fourth panelists as well, Dr. Uh, Mosiola and, and Dr. Vilok. Huh? I, I, I was kind of like, um, really, it was a very touching uh, presentation. Uh, and, and I wonder, how did you conduct interview during a pandemic uh, in, 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 the, in the context of Germany? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the. Can question. you share? Um, yeah. Can you share the stories? Uh, yeah. I suppose that would be very interesting. Yeah. I'll go ahead, Ron. Um, 
No, we um, we did we, we did conduct through Skype or through um, um, other means of um, online communication. Um, and in fact, um, because I did my research on um, the Triple Win project, and and so I kind of have um, history already of. Um, how to um, reach out to uh, Filipino nurses who have come to, to Germany through the bilateral agreement. Um, and so, although I did not interview the same people that I did for my PhD, um, this is kind of like a different approach. Um, and in fact, I, um, I, I or Doc, and Dr. Ron Bilog, we chanced upon this blog um, written by a Filipino nurse who came through this triple win project. And um, she wrote in that blog, um, um, like how she um, received the news that she would suddenly be uh, sort of volunteering. So it was kind of like a forced volunteer in a way um, to be part of um, the COVID-19 station in one of the hospitals here in Germany. And so I read that blog and, I, and then I started communicating with her and then we asked if she knew somebody else. And so we got to know um, other nurses through through this blog post, in fact. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, do you think, do you find any difference between conducting face-to-face -face interview and conducting interview via, you know, like platform like Skype? Do you see any difference as a researcher? That's that's in fact a very interesting question because I I yeah um, I myself have been um, um, looking at you know methodologies on say or methods on how to conduct research during the pandemic because a lot of um, social science re researchers especially anthropologists who cannot really go to the field um, you know enter the field and you know physically and how do you how do you sort of conduct um, research through that. And, and I've um, recently um, started reading like digital, um, uh, digital methodologies. And, and a part of it is, you know, how to conduct research through like online communication and things like that. Although, um, yes, there are different things that are, uh, there are things that are different, but then, um, how we conducted uh, interviews is through, um, in Tagalog, we would say pakikipag-usap. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of like a normal, normal conversation, like how you are and, you know. Um, so I would say um, with, with one particular nurse that we interviewed, I, I think um, when he contracted the virus, I wouldn't say that it was, he was because he was very emotional and he, he even cried during our talk. And so I I think I still would need to reflect on what um, really differences it would make if it was conducted online. But everyone knows that we are all in this situation that you couldn't really uh, be physically together. So I think everyone has this background the nurses themselves and us as researchers um we kind of just have to deal with this situation that we're missing um some physical contact but then we try to to cope cope with things so um dr ron how did you um how was your experience ron please unmute oh sorry yeah can you hear me now yeah, we can do yes. it now. Yes. Yeah, I think one um, one important experience during the field work or during that particular uh, online or virtual interview is, uh, you know, they, we were able to do it transnationally. Cleovi was talking about the situation in Germany. I was talking about the situation in the Philippines. And we were all, um, we were all synthesizing the events and the, you know, the, 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 the things happening um, how the experiences or our experiences of pandemic in the Philippines and in Germany. Yeah, I think uh, th th that was actually a great uh, conversation with the interviewee. But at the same time, as Dr. Masuela mentioned, um, I also think that there are more 
uh, they are more open because they they know that there was really no physical contact so they can just cry or they can just you know um open up and uh, share the experiences very personal experiences about the pandemic their their encounter with the virus their you know the, the moment or the those experiences when they got sick yeah okay thank you thank you for sharing the experience of conducting into digital in, uh, interview online during a pandemic yeah that's uh, really helpful i think it's going to be helpful for a lot of research, social researchers out there for anthropologists as well uh, i wonder uh, whether dr fernando has anything to ask or uh, meanwhile there is a uh, one audience uh, from the q and a uh, the same person earlier Kamaru, uh, mr kamarudin mohammad uh, he's asking he's throwing this question to i think dr sudiman uh, he asked, how do Indonesian Muslims respond to the issue on Congregational Friday prayer uh, during the pandemic? Uh, meanwhile, Dr. Fernando, if you have any question uh, to ask, feel free to raise. Uh, well, there's a question on Facebook that I will share. Oh, later. okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Sudiman, please. Yeah, uh, the intersection between uh, public health issues uh, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic with uh, religious issues, particularly with uh, uh, Muslim community in Indonesia as a Muslim majority country is a very interesting uh, area of further research because Muslim community and Muslim organization in Indonesia is not a homogeneous uh, uh, group and their view toward the pandemic is uh, complex some uh, Islamic organization are fully uh, or mostly supportive to uh, public health responses, but some other uh, organization uh, that tend to be non-mainstream uh, Islamic organization oppose uh, uh, the public health uh, measures, including the congregation for Friday uh, prayer. But uh, I think it is uh, safe to say that most of the mainstream uh, Islamic organization in Indonesia, especially in uh, during the peak of the pandemic uh, in March, April, and May, fully support the government's uh, uh, decision to uh, limit the social interaction, including uh, the uh, organization of uh, uh, prayer, uh, prayer in the form of Friday uh, uh, prayers, but also during the big uh, eight uh, festival, as, as uh, some of us know that the Muslims uh, in Indonesia or Malaysia uh, have two eights, two big celebrations every year. That, and this also involves a massive human uh, mobility, uh, from especially from the urban area to the, to the uh, rural area. The government actually provide a strong uh, suggestion not to uh, to go home at the time. But since this is a very uh, culturally embedded practice, there are still many uh, were many people who who decide to go home at the time. And uh, two weeks or three weeks after that, we start to see the the increase again in 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 COVID nineteen uh, uh, cases. Now, mostly uh, pray the pray, uh, Friday prayers are conducted in, in most, uh, most in, in, in Indonesia, even though there are also some people who restrict themselves by quoting the basic principles of Islamic teaching to prioritize uh, safety. Thank you, Dr. Sudiman. Uh, there are two questions lining up. Huh? One is for Mr. Kim Kong Heng uh, from Aisha. Uh, University, Aisha is from University of Tun Hussein On in Malaysia. Uh, so uh, her question is, uh, uh, you mentioned that the number of cases in Cambodia is small since Cambodians are used to live in an environment full of germs and dust, so they have better resistance towards COVID-19. So does it mean that people from the Philippines, Malaysia, do not live in that kind of environment, resulting in low resistance towards the virus and causing a hike in the number of cases? Thank you. It also sounds like a more like a, a biomedical question. Okay. Uh, 
I like I have presented, there are a number of factors that contribute to uh, Cambodian success uh, dealing with COVID-19. That's just one, my opinion only. I mean, there are other factors that uh, contribute to that success. So like wearing masks is one important factor. People living far away from each other, like in the province, another factor. But that's just, I suspect, it's not my main argument. It's just a small part that, that I think might have, but there is no research on that yet, but might have uh, contained the spread of COVID-19. Who knows if we, but yeah, the question that, how about in other country like Philippines and other, yeah, I think so. If that is the case, this is not, this is not true, but it's just my own uh, perception only that there are many other factors. So this is, can be one, but or it cannot be one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kim Kong. Another question come from uh, Dr. Benite. Uh, he's actually a uh, associate professor from USM. Uh, he has a question for uh, Dr. Cleovi. He asks, how do the Germans perceive the role of Filipino nurses in helping to fight the COVID-19? And were special incentives given to foreign nurses involved in pandemic in Germany? That's for Clovey. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think that's interesting in terms of very um, specifically just the role of Filipino nurses. Um, I think because it's part of um, Filipino nurses come here through part of the bilateral agreement and and in fact, when the nurses started coming in um, from 2013, um, they are sort of, um, they are given um, um, an integration, say an integration program. And so they, um, their role is very much similar to a locally hired nurse. And so um, they're kind of sort of integrated in, in the local health system. And so I, from the nurses that I've interviewed from 2014 up to now, they wouldn't really say that there's a difference between the treatment of locally hired nurses and the ones from foreign trained countries. So um, the perception of the role would be um, interesting as with one nurse um, that we interviewed, that Dr. Ron and I interviewed, um, he, um, he's been in, in Germany for like, uh, one or two years. And then when he volunteered, um, at a COVID-19 station, um, after two or three months or so, he felt since it, he is new. So he felt that, you know, if you, if you're new in the system, you, you cannot really, you know, grasp everything. And since he's new, um, he, he felt that um, he didn't really have much of a voice. But then when he started um, volunteering, started working at a COVID-19 station, he, he was um, asked, always asked by his colleagues, okay, how do I do with, uh, you know, swab tests and which protective equipment should I wear? And so he felt really, um, we can say recuperated. So he's now, he's now sort of really much embedded in the system and he suddenly felt like he has a voice and he has, that he's an expert in, in doing this job that he does. So part of it is, you know, calling. That's why he volunteered, that's what he said. Um, and even though there, there are not many really incentives, um, they would say actually, um, well, they were given say um, personal protective equipment, that's a given. Um, but in terms of hazard pay, that depends on the hospital and that depends on the region where they are. Some are still struggling to, um, to receive um, or to demand for hazard pay, um, but they're given, for instance, food stabs so they can um, voucher, so they can, they can um, purchase food um, in some particular restaurants and they're given like food, for instance, so meals um, three times a day. So that's the little incentive that they get. But in terms of salary um, and, or hazard pay, there's not much of a difference there. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Cleovi. Uh, there is one audience, uh, the question and, and some comment coming from Facebook. Huh? 
uh, from this audience, uh, he's, he or she uh, said uh, uh, to the speaker who presented about Philippines, actually, Philippines had only around 50 cases in March, yet the amount of cases has increased rapidly during August and even replaced Indonesia as the most infected country in ASEAN. In terms of population, Vietnamese is only 9 million less than Philippines. Uh, and it is not an archipelago country. By saying archipelago, I mean the people there are less connected, yet Vietnam currently somehow still can control the virus. Philippines is an archipelago country, and as has been mentioned, the cases are low as other country in the very first time, yet the virus uh, still successfully spread. Uh, do you think Philippine government has failed to contain the virus? Does politic status in the country uh, make any obstacle uh, for the government to fight against the virus? Uh, I don't know whether any uh, Filipino scholars here like to respond. I think this question probably, because clearly it's currently based in Germany. And I think those uh, currently in, in, in Philippines are in better position to respond to this question. Hello. Hi, uh, Dr. Vilao. Yeah, carry on. Uh, please go ahead yeah. with your response. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yes. Uh, of course, we've been. This is, of course, I'm not. I'm not really an expert on uh, epidemiology, but I would say that uh, there is really uh, uh, the government has really been implementing policies based on. Uh, the recommendations uh, that are quite, you know, highly political. Sometimes they are not really based on or scientifically based. Uh, the government has um, appointed um, these SARS or uh, you know leaders or or or, or these uh, uh, should we say uh, implementers who are actually not. Um, or do not, they do not have scientific background or background in epidemiology, but uh, more, more uh, actually they have, the government has preferred those leaders coming from the military. So it's actually more militarized, it's more politicized, and that has been causing the, fa I think, this is my personal opinion, that, that has been causing the failure of the government to contain or to uh, to uh, minimize the spread of the virus. So yeah, that's actually my opinion. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Villa. I think uh, we are coming close, really close to 4 p.m. And this is uh, the last question uh, from, uh, I think from Facebook, huh? uh, from Kim Long Cheng. Uh, he, he asked, uh, can each speaker explain in a few words about post-pandemic social resilience building and economic recovery strategies of their respective uh, countries? Uh, have they been, have these strategies been adequate, effective, and if not, how should be done differently? How much has ASEAN as a region been doing in the fight against the pandemic and cope with the uh, fallout of the regional economy? Yeah, I think uh, this would be uh, viewing, judging that the t we, we don't have more uh, much time. Huh? So I, I suppose this is the last question for everyone. Can, can I go first? Oh, sure. Can yeah. I, yeah. No um, yeah, because part of this I have explained in terms of Cambodia case. Uh, in terms of Asian, I think it's a bit hard because each country now is trying to control the spread of COVID-19. They're still trying to <laughs> uh, have, I mean, do stop the spread in their own country. So very busy in, in, in a, a country level. But there's still, uh, I've seen a lot of meeting between a country in Asia, uh, how they can help each other to to uh, cope, uh, to deal with COVID-19, to contain the spread. So I think uh, one of the things that we should do is to share data, share share data and, and try to improve transparency as well. Because um, like recently, um, Cambodia and Vietnam, like for example, Vietnam announced that, okay, three people from Cambodia have COVID-19, but Cambodia said that we don't have COVID-19. So this is this is issue regarding 
information sharing or transparency. So for example, okay, if for example, in Malaysia know that five people, five Cambodian in Malaysia have COVID-19 and travel to Cambodia, just have share this information so that we, we, we are more careful, we can control the spread. So if we keep information to ourselves, we don't share it accurate information openly and and work together still, the, the spread still keep going. For example, if one country can, can contain COVID-19, but we are not living in isolation, people will travel throughout the region. So they will bring virus with them. So I think very important to share information, be transparent and provide accurate information. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so who like to speak next? Perhaps uh, Dr. Sudiman? then followed by uh, Dr. Mosila and Dr. Bilok. Okay, uh, Dr. Sudiman. Thank you, Dr. Paul. I think my final uh, comments that uh, COVID-19 provide us a very important uh, lesson about the importance of uh, science and also the importance of uh, strengthen uh, the health system to uh, face with the pandemic. There is no guarantee that the current pandemic is the last uh, pandemic that we will face in our lifetime. And we can see uh, so far that the country uh, in many regions in the world who relatively manage well uh, the, the impact of the pandemic are those countries with sufficient investment in health system, in science infrastructure, and also in, in uh, facilitating community uh, participation uh, uh, for preventative uh, measures. And also, I, I strongly agree with uh, uh, Kim Kong Heng's uh, suggestion previously about the need to strengthen our uh, cooperation at the regional level, especially in facilitating uh, the sharing of uh, transparent and credible uh, data so the country in this region can work uh, together to face the current pandemic and possibly the next uh, pandemic and the very last things that i want to say the need for the countries in the region also to work in ecological uh, problems because the current pandemic is a zoonotic uh, pathogen that actually originated from the uh, uh, wild animal and uh, we also know that there is a very rapid and serious uh, ec ecological degradation in, in Southeast Asia. These issues need to be uh, addressed uh, together as uh, Asian countries' uh, solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudiman. Uh, Dr. Mosila, please. Yes, um, I think the, the other two speakers have already mentioned the very important parts, and but I, I just would like to emphasize that um, with our talk today, we really um, highlighted um, narratives of, or the importance of care work and the importance of um, taking care of health personnel as part of the healthcare system. So it's not just funding, but it's about the people. Um, and it's um, recognizing that the uprooting of um, health personnel can, um, can directly undermine um, the countries or like the Philippines capacity to provide adequate care, especially in these trying times. So as Dr. Zierman said, that it's probably not the, the only thing that we will experience. Um, um, and so the Philippines kind of realizes um, that it needs to take care of its own healthcare system first in order to safeguard the right of um, health of patients. Okay, thank you, Dr. Masula and uh, Dr. Velo. Okay, um, I think I will focus on um, the the theme of our uh, of our discussion a while ago, which is actually migration governance. So the post pandemic migration governance in the Philippines, I think uh, uh, in the past, you now we have been saying that the Philippines is known for its very very good my um, practices in managing migration. But in uh, because of the pandemic, we have witnessed so many flaws and inconsistencies of mechanisms of migration governance. We have been so much eager to deploy workers, but we did not consider Filipinos coming back and rep repatriating. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need to um, ask these questions. How do we integrate them 
to the society? How do we give them livelihood? We have to uh, reimagine the post-pandemic order by making sure that our migration governance is more proactive. And as I've said a while ago, we have to empower workers, empowering not only Filipino nurses, but also Filipino overseas Filipino workers in general so that they don't really need to leave the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all the, uh, thank you for the, uh, all the panelists for really, really rich conversation. I'm actually still trying to digest what you all have shared through this uh, uh, today's uh, uh, webinar. Uh, before I close uh, this webinar, uh, there is a question for all panelists because uh, some audience from Facebook and, and from uh, Zoom as well, they are asking whether they can have a copy of your slides. I understand that uh, some of you probably, your work are still in progress. So it is really up to you whether you think it is uh, um, convenient and to share your slides or not. If you think that you're, you're, you're still trying to work on it and then it is not a good timing to share, it is okay. But for those uh, who, write, who like, uh, really like to have a copy, uh, Dr. Sudiman has already agreed to give uh, his copy uh, and then the rest uh, perhaps later Okay, but I'll, I'll give you my email. For those who are interested, you can send me an email and then I'll forward the slide to you. Uh, only with the uh, approval of uh, the four speakers. Huh? Okay, uh, and then secondly, uh, thanks uh, everyone, especially uh, we, we actually have some assistance from our USM tech staff. Huh? They might be listening to this webinar, they might not be, but uh, thanks to them, even, even though at the end of the day, uh, because of some technical problem, we didn't use USM's uh, uh, digital platform uh, webex uh, for this webinar, but then they have been helping before this. Uh, at the end of the day, because of the technical problem, uh, we uh, have the help of uh, Dr. Fernando. Uh, really, really a big thank you to Dr. Fernando for offering us this a uh, Zoom platform uh, to conduct this uh, webinar. So do you have any final words to say? And also uh, Professor uh, Azlinda, uh, our Dean of uh, School of Social Sciences, I wonder whether the two of you have any, to, any final words to say? I just want to thank our panelists for joining us this afternoon. So Dr. Suderman, uh, Mr. Kim Kong Heng, Dr. Mosuela and Dr. Vlog, uh, we're really honored to have had you join us. And of course, Dr. Poor, thank you for everything. Dr. Aslisa, Aslinda Asman, uh, it was an honor to partner with you for this event. And of course, to our audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fernando. Uh, what, uh, Prof. Aslinda, do you have any? Are you still with us? Uh, she's very, very busy, but uh, I'm glad that uh, she was able to give a few words at the beginning. Uh, maybe uh, she's not here, she's not around. Uh, so, but uh, I think that's all for today's webinar. Thank you again, everyone for joining us and stay till the last minute, of, uh, the, the, the end of this webinar. Thank you, everyone.